for today I'll be talking about, it's just basically about hornbills, um, looking into the names and how we derive those names. So it's kind of weird title, so bear with me. So I'll share my screen now. So my title is um, quite long. It's called uh, Dula, Dulungan Kaleo Grande Tepanay Walden's Hornbill. Something I pronounce in Japanese, and of course, Rabdotorino's Rabdo Walden's So this is a, a, a sort of a topic about hornbills and, and birds in general on how we name things. It's, so what's in the name? So it's encouraging um, our audience to do studies on not just ornithology, but also taxonomy and ethnoornithology. So again, thank you for the introduction. So now we're celebrating a World Wildlife Day. And of course, the theme is about forest and livelihood, sustaining people and planet. So as an ornithologist um, um, who, study, who specialized in the study of Bucerote formis, which is, of course, uh, mainly hornbills, uh, I'll be using hornbills as an example because they are recognized as what we call farmers of the rainforest. But before, before that, I'll go through with the basics of what is ornithology and what are Bucerotiformis. So ornithology is, of course, the study of birds, their taxonomy, their biology, their ecology, and natural history. So everything about birds. Um, sabi nga sa Tagalog, dalub, dalub ibunan. Uh, dalub ibun. So uh, one of the things I love to study is the kalaw, which is, of course, a member of the group known as Bucerotiformis. They used to belong with the order um, Coraciformis, but I'm not gonna go into the details of how they spit up all the different orders recently. It involves a lot of molecular biology as well. So um, I'll, I'll try to, I'll probably go through it a bit later. So <laughs> Bucerotiformis is the order of hornbills, ground hornbills, hoopoos and wood hoopoos. So yeah, hoopoos po yun as extreme left with their nice orange crest. Uh, wood hoopoos are the ones on the extreme right. And of course, in the middle, we have uh, Bucerotidae, which are the hornbills. Uh, there are two species of ground hornbills, Bucorbidae. Uh, I'll, I'll show you a few of them later. But of course, they represent one group of um, interesting forest-dwelling tropical birds. Okay, there are about 62 species as of date. So I'm following marami kasi iba-ibang versions of the classification, some say it's 59, some say it's 60, it, depending which uh, checklist you're following. But I'm following the IUCN Hornbill Specialist Group checklist. Um, you can go through their website at iucnhornbills.org. There's also a, the, the checklist is there, the representative species. So it includes about 32 species of Asian hornbills and 30 species of African hornbills. It includes both the Bukorbidae, the ground hornbills, which are two species, and the rest are 60 species of Bucerotidae. Um, so one of my claim to fame sort of is um, finishing what we call a complete phylogeny of uh, Bucerotidae and Bucorbidae, um, which I published in 2013 as a result of my DPhil in Oxford. So um, I kind of went through a, um, a long process of learning molecular biology. So yes, I mentioned but again, it's not too late. So if you feel that you want to grow further in terms of taxonomy, yes, I learned it quite late in my PhD on, on how to use molecular systematics and, and understanding the relationship, especially with taxonomy, especially taxonomy being uh, the science of naming, describing, classifying organisms. So I was able to understand all the relationship of all the species as you see here on a poster, uh, also a poster done by, uh, this is Rohan, who's an amazing cartoonist. So yes, you can also access his poster at greenhumor.com. You can also go to the iusinhornbills.org website to see his um, um, collection of cartoons. So uh, this is a result of my paper looking into relationships of each of the species of hornbills. Um, I'm not going to go into details of that. Okay. So we'll go into what we think is important in terms of hornbills. So hornbills are recognized as farmers of the rainforest. Um, one of the books I so admire is this book by uh, my friends, uh, Margaret Kennard and Timothy O'Brien. It's, it's an amazing collection of um, stories and facts about hornbills, the ecology and conservation of Asian hornbills. And actually that was one of the, um, uh, the drivers which led to my own dissertation because 
isa dun sa gaps na pinakita nila through the research was there was no phylogeny of hornbills. And so systematics was kind of vague at the time. And so, which led me to do and answer those gaps for them. And we recognize hornbills because they are this kind of co-evolutionary relationship with a lot of rainforest trees. And that's why they're called forest farmers. They help disperse seeds, especially large seeded fruit, uh, which are difficult. For example, uh, buto ng pili, ang kalaki-laki niya. Kung ganito din kalaki yung ibon na magdi-disperse, parang hindi pwede, no? So, kailangan malaki din yung ibon na magdi-disperse. So, hornbills can disperse these large seeded trees. So, na ba example ng mga large seeded trees? So, here's a study that I did, um, part of my dissertation, was look, looking into the fruits of endemic forest trees that are preferred by wild hornbills. So, there's common associated with hornbills themselves. And that's why we call them hornbill dispersed fruits. Um, um, most of the examples are these nutmegs, um, members of Mediaceae, such as the glaya, pd nut, which is canarium, cinnamomum, and various timber trees. Um, so here is a, a photo, uh, well, uh, um, an artwork of the Rufus Hornbill and the Karagumai, which I studied in Sierra Madre, which they feed on. So at the young details of it. So here's not a Philippine Hornbill, it's actually a rhinoceros Hornbill from adjacent Borneo, but you can see Yung nasa bibig niya is an example of a seed with um, still part of the pulp around it. Uh, so it's actually a nutmeg. Yung nutmeg na ginagamit natin sa ano. So yung mismong nakabalat sa kanya, yun yung nagiging mace. And the seed is the one you make into nutmeg. So they're very important, these myristica uh, species of fruit. So myristaceae are the nutmegs. Aglaya is another example of uh, an edible fruit. And notice they're quite dehiscent. Dehiscent ibig sabihin yung Pag nag-gripe na siya, bumubukas yung, yung fruit. Um, so it's only kind of the difficulty of for other frugivores to get that, uh, the, the seed with the, with the coating on it. So, yeah. so talagang very specialized for hornbills. Okay, so because of that, we think that hornbills are quite important for maintaining um, the balance in terms of, yeah, dispersing not only these endemic trees, but also uh, keeping the balance within an ecosystem. And the problem is a lot of them are endangered. 42% um, of the world's hornbills are now threatened or near threatened. Um, 26 species under threat, including two which are critically endangered. And of course they're found in the Philippines, uh, Walden's hornbill, which is my focus here, and the Sulu hornbill. The Philippines is quite blessed because out of the 62 species, 11 are found in the Philippines and found nowhere else but the Philippines. And so we're quite lucky then. Yabang kaido no 11 as atin, 20%. So, which makes the Philippines quite rich. And that's not just a story about hornbills, it's a story which goes through all other organisms. And I think um, Arvin and um, Philip will explain that further. Um, so, eight are currently listed as threatened and near threatened. So here's a lot of them, there's no, two are critically endangered, uh, three are vulnerable, and two are endangered, and one being near threatened. Uh, we are lucky because some of the species that we have not necessarily endangered, like the Luzon Directed Cornbill, which you see around the campus of UPLB, they are least concerned, so not threatened at the moment. So going back to my topic, the Dulungan, uh, what's in the name? So it's sort of my take on 500 years of the Philippines, uh, Dulungan being the old name, Inirigaynon, and then Calao Grande de Panay. So when the Spanish arrived, they gave that name Calao. I'll explain later. And then, of course, the Americans arrived and then gave it an English name, which is, of course, Walden's Hornbill. Then we have the Japanese occupation, hence the Japanese name, which I cannot pronounce. But of course, you have to put them by and bind them all together because in later age, we recognize science, and science is represented by the scientific name, Rabdotorinus Walden, especially the one which I added, Rabdotorinus. Marami po nagalit sa akin, adding that name. It used to be called Aceros Waldenai. Di ba parang red and fuchsia? Red, madali spell, R-E-D. Fuchsia, oops. So Aceros yung old name niya, and then uh, during my course of my studies, changed it to the older name, Rabdotorinus. So I'll explain later a bit further. So it's a part of what we call the binomial system of nomenclature, of course, started by Carolus Linnaeus. You have the genus and the species name. So the Philippines is quite unusual because 
well, ornithology in general is in a taxonomic flux. Because of the new studies, um, we're still continuing. Okay, po tayo? Okay, po tayo? Are we okay, Marcus? Yes, yes. Okay. Very clear, sir. Very clear. Okay, so there are how many species are there birds in the, in the Philippines as well as in the world? So we are in kind of a taxonomic class, ever-changing, but in very dynamic. We're still discovering new species. I can, don't know if you can see that. On the uppermost right, you have there uh, a, a photo of um, the Sierra Madre uh, ground babbler. That's actually a species described by Philip Albiola. So it says among the discovered in a species. So we're still discovering species up to now. And there's a lot of species called split. So the Maria Capra, which is photo photographed in the middle, used to be shared, we call that uh, Rifidura javanica. So we share it with the rest of Southeast Asia. But now it's recognized as an endemic species, Rifidura nigritoquis, which is for only in the Philippines. So Manami next is split up and we kind of add in that particular dynamics into the species. So any examples that we use for that? So uh, one is, I did a study on hornbills looking into how the dynamics occurs. So looking into what you call a phenotypic core, looking into morphology, um, uh, morphometrics, plumage color, and then you have the genotypic score because based on its genetic divergence. I'm using uh, here based on a threshold by price on mitochondrial DNA that the score is for. Then you use the threshold for phenotypic score based on um, the Tobias criteria, which is the quantitative criteria for species delimitation. Uh, published in 2010 by Tobias et al. in IBIS. So we use those two different definitions to look into anabionics split from one species or the other. So classic example is the one you see in the middle. There are two, two sets of birds there with a the yellow belly and the red belly. Do you think it's one species or two species? <laughs> so here is the standard core uh, scoring system by uh, Tobias 2010. So we evaluate the uh, the phenotype best based on uh, polytypic pairs. You're comparing uh, data from two different species or two different taxa, uh, morphometrics, uh, color of plumage, color to bear parts and skin, vocalization scores, uh, differences in distribution ecology, even sociality and breeding behavior, whether they're um, um, cooperative breeding or not. Then you have a course based on the, the genotype. So you have, so I'm using uh, mitochondrial DNA, uh, cytochrome B2 to describe and compare uh, the, the divergence between a pair of species. I also used um, a, uh, a nuclear gene uh, to describe, uh, especially if, uh, between certain groups of species. But uh, mitochondrial and dynamic comparisons. Uh, comparison. So here you have, uh, it's an interesting way to, to kind of plot together the the genetic divergence and the phenotypic score. So seven going up and four going up on either side. So here you can see which species remain as subspecies, which side, which we call group B and C, can kind of represent cryptic species, so they may need to be split up. And the ones on group A, which pass both scores, which are valid species. So an example of valid gen would be um, a ser the the those two, so the example of a cryptic species, I'll explain later. And then yung aceros kanina, yun po yung magiging example natin of the valid species. Okay, so ito yung example ng cryptic. Again, here's a nice uh, distribution based on the phylogeny of hornbills of the world. So in the Philippines, we have what we call the kalaw or the rufous hornbill. So they're subspecies, so it's a trinomial system, make subspecies, distributed across um, Eastern Philippines, Luzon, Visayas, and Mindanao. So we always thought, ah, sabi nila, baka parang separate species. Before they were described as separate species, but now we recognize them as subspecies. And again, we need to change that idea by looking into taxonomy. So here's that clade. You can actually see how different the three uh, taxa are. So in 1995, Kemp already suggested, baka hindi pa pa natin split up yan, mukha naman sila magkaiba. So, but we didn't have data for genetic divergence. And because I did that, so we're able to add in the information for genetic divergence. But putting in the score of phenotype and genotype, we were only able to look into splitting me up into two. So, ang na split lang namin, yung pula na nasa taas, 
and yung dalawa na nasa baba. So up to two species split rather than three. However, my student, uh, Shari Guerra, did additional analysis looking into vocalizations and she was able to add in more information that helps us say, ah, pwede nga sila ni split sa patlo. So phenotypically, they are separable into three different species. So at the moment, we accept the two species. They're now recognized internationally as two species. However, because medyo late na yung mabot yung data namin vocalization, we're now waiting for them to be accepted um, as three species. Okay, so using that premise of defining species limits, we go back to um, the rufous-headed hornbill or Acerus waldenai, the dulong, dulungan. So it's actually, if you want to go further, we have, you go to our, the Museum Natural History website um, and there's a, um, um, a summary of what the rufous-headed hornbill is in our website. Uh, it was first described by Sharp uh, from specimens that were brought in by Joseph uh, Steer um, during the, there's a lot of expeditions that are just during the American time, the Marami Nig expeditions to Philippines. So one of them is, is actually brought, uh, kept in, the, the type is kept in the Museum of Zoology at the University of Michigan. Um, the name, uh, originally described as Cranurinus Waldenai, uh, was named after the Viscount Walden, who was a Scottish soldier and ornithologist. So he's usually known as Lord Arthur Hale, Colonel Arthur Hale, the ninth Marquis of Tweedledale. And that was the time he was recognized. Then after about 1876, he was recognized as Viscount Walden. And because of his contributions to ornithology, Sharp named after uh, one of the birds, which he described to Viscount Walden in honor of him. So in etymology, the origins of the name, Bakit Walden. So it's a patronym recognizing the contributions of Viscount Walden. So here's a picture of Viscount Walden. Okay, so before it was Cranurinus waldenai and be placed under the genus Aceros. Why? Because Aceros is a very large clade of, or of hornbills. But then my study uh, later revealed that Aceros, which is actually this clade on the left, which starts from Nycticeros to Aceros, F, you can see that on the left, the clade F. So that's the Aceros clade. It can be separated into one, two, three different clades. So the upper clade is Ricticeros, the middle clade becomes Penelopides, and then the third clade is a mixture of Penelopides and Aceros, and then Nagiisa si the Aceros ni Palensis as a fourth clade. So there are actually four clades under F. So we separated it and, of course, gave them a new name for the Yung nga, yung clade na apat, yung Aceros waldenai, Leucocephalus, Exerhatus, and Corrugatus. So we tried giving it a name called Cranobrontres, but uh, hindi do applicable. So later on with the Corregidum, we were able to add in the right name, Rabdotorinus. I know it's a difficult thing to spell. Double R in the middle, so kailangan nyo remember. Nakukunot na yun noon ni, ni Marcos, nakikita ko sa spelling pa lang. <laughs> Okay, so it represents two species in the Philippines and two species outside the Philippines, Corrugatus and Exoratus in Indonesia. So they're all put together. And in similarities, they all have the same oil gland. They have the same staccato call. And thus the name was, of course, noted to be the correct name according to, actually it's Mayer and Wigglesworth, 1895. So here's the, rep the four representative species as you see. So next starts again from Aceros. So dahil nga hindi na applicable yung Aceros because of the phylogeny, we can't use Aceros anymore. That only applies to the species Nipalensis. So we started, tried using Cranurinus, which was sharp 1877. Applies because of the rule of seniority, mas matanda siya. But Cranurinus only applies to the rithid hornbill and does not apply to Penelopides exerhatus. So hindi pa rin pwede. So I used Cranobrontes, which was more or less both Penelopides and Aceros, but it's 1921. And the older one is Rapdotorinus by 1895. So again, the rule of seniority, um, A.B. Mayer and Wigglesworth is more applicable as a genus name for the entire clade. And thus we use Rapdotorinus. 
It's now being applied throughout uh, all the changes. Actually, went to nagulat ako kasi in yung contribution ko to science, and then I realized when I went to San Diego Zoo, they already changed the name from Aceros to Rabdo Torinos. And daming asigur na gagat. Hilap hilap pa man din spell. Okay, so what was uh, how do we then recognize the true species in the Philippines? So um, the rithid hornbills in the Philippines is uh, the Mindanao rithid and the Visayan um, rithid, which is Waldenai. And before they were recognized as one species. So we did the same thing with the phenotype and the genotype score and their molecular diver divergence is 5.36, passes the score of four, and their phenotypic score is 10, passes the score of seven. So they are in fact, two separate species. And so before they were recognized as one species, subspecies lang si Waldenai ngayon, we recognize them as two separate species. And because of that, you look into the, the split in the area of occurrence and area of occupancy, then you kind of give them the evaluation, the conservation status of separate uh, populations because Waldenai is a very small area of occupancy, thus it is recognized as critically endangered, while leucocephalus as a wider distribution is recognized as near threatened. So yan yung kanilang conservation status at this the moment. Excuse me? Okay, going back to the name Dulungan. So if, if you want to understand further about scientific names, there is actually a webinar that we had at the Museum of Natural History um, uh, presented by Dr. Rene Olit on biological nomenclature. So if you go to our YouTube channel of the museum, uh, ito po yung link. Um, I'll just go to UPLB Museum Natural History uh, uh, YouTube channel. You'll see all the different uh, seminars there and go to updated order, up, updated orders to get a more clear definition of how we name things. So going back to the name Kalao. Kalao is actually spelled as C-A-L-A-O with of course the apostrophe on A. And then we changed the spelling to a Filipino spelling K-A-L-A-W. Kalao is actually a Spanish and French term for hornbill. So it's, it's actually an adopted name. So it's what we do uh, in terms of what we call linguistics of birds. So it's part of what we study, what we call ethno-ornithology. So depending on the vernacular name. So here's a picture of the Sulu hornbill. Uh, most people who are Dayo to Tawi-Tawi will call it Talusi, because it's Kadamihan Isabuano. But the original, well, inhabitants will call it Tawusi because of the black and color, but that's the name that they acquire. So again, nagbabago yung local name. That's why it's good to have scientific names because scientific names keeps us a best uh, together. Meron kang standard because all the other names change. And we don't even know what the names that we use before in terms of our ancestors to say, through the course of colonization, we add those names. So Kadao is not the original name, it's an acquired name. So we have to go back into the language that was used by our indigenous people. So Kalau being a borrowed name. So Talusi is a Visayan name for hornbill, but again, it's carried across by yeah, migratory kasi mga Visaya. Eh. So nadadala nila to Palawan, nadadala nila to Bindanao, the same name. So it's not originally the original name for that particular species. So example nga yung Palawan. So mga Tagalog, mga Katanawan, when they, uh, they migrated to Palawan, they brought the name Kalau. So, ah, kalaw yan, yung Palawan hornbill. But because it's a Tagalog word. The same thing with the Visayan migrants, they call it Talusi. So there's two names, Talusi and Akalaw. But if you ask the original tribes of Palawan, example, the Batak tribe, they call it Bayawan or Bawayan, something like that. So it's a different name altogether. It's, so it's important for us to document IP names before they, become, they disappear. So, ganun din yung nangyari with Dulungan and Talarak. In Panay, it's called Dulungan. It's a Ligayno name. But in Negros, they call it Talarak. I'm not sure if it's Talarak is for general hornbill, which also includes Tariktik. Uh, but they call the smaller one Tariktik or Talusi. So, you have these two different names. And it's important for us to recognize and document these local names. So, I did a paper sometime in 2011 called Enumerating the Ethno-Ornithological Ethno Importance of Philippine hornbills. And again, uh, it's online for free. 
on Raffles Bulletin of Zoology. Um, it's based on the study um, called Ethnoornithology, which is the study of the relationships between people and birds. And I wanted to kind of emphasize there that we used to have these old names. So here's a, a photo of the Kalau or the Rufus Hornbill. And before we had these old names from the different uh, indigenous people. So the Ifugaos would call it Angao or Kango. The Aitas would call it the Gasalo or the Kalo. In Ulujana, of course, it's now adopted as Kalao because it's modernized. In Spanish, they sometimes call it the Relo del Monte or the, 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 the clock of the mountains because you know, there's a synchronous time for calling. So again, we, we associate things with the species that we have. However, looking into places which have more than one species. So I'll show here, there's a map um, showing that there is more than one kalau, the term kalau for hornbill, in a particular island in the Philippines. So blue represents islands with two or more species of kalau. One is yellow, which has only one species of kalau. And then orange or red is actually a place where we have three species of kala. So that but may don't have name associated for that particular. So an um, example kalanjan would be blue. On the blue area you have in Luzon the kala, which is bigger, and the tariktik or the tariktik, which is smaller. Ganun din sa Mindana, sa um, Bohol, Samar, and Leyte, where they have the bigger kala, Rufus Hornbill, and Talusi, which is the Mindanao hornbill or the Sama hornbill. And then you have Dulangan or Dulunga, sorry, Dulungan or Talarak, and then the Talusi, which are again two different sizes of hornbills, one big and one small in Negros Panay. So at least Don Madalima distinguished. The problem is we don't have names locally for the ones in red for Mindanao. There's three species the Rufus, the Mindanao wrinkled, the Rithid, and the Mindanao hornbill. So again, we need to document those names before we dis it all disappears. Bucket. Well, a lot of names are basically adapted because they're onomatopoeic. They're based on the names that the people associate as what they hear from the call. Okay, in the name Tariktik, because the call of the Tariktik is tik, 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 tik. So parang tunog Tariktik din. So ganun din yung original name of the Kalao. Well, Kaao, they call it in, in Aita. Kaao because the kaw, kaw, ganun yung, yung, yung call niya is quite the same. So it's all onomatopoeic. So here's some of those local names and the syllabicated uh, vocalizations that they associate with hornbills. But yes, it's all local names. So, but they vary across, my God, the many languages and the dialects and even the indigenous people, which help define all those names. So what we need is the official Filipino name one that binds us a country together. So here is my suggestion for the official Filipino names of all the different species of Kalao. So Kalao ng Luzon, Kalao ng Samar, Kalao ng Mindanao. Uh, Dulungan ng Panay, Dulungan ng Mindanao, Talusi ng Padawan, Talusi ng... Of course, you can still use Tausi if you want, but it's just kind of an, a suggestion to make things consistent in Filipino. So it's not the Kalog, it's not the Cyan, it's the Filipino name. And so this is just an example for hornbills. What do we need now is an official name for all the different birds in the Philippines. Why? If you go through Avibase, so Avibase is one database for birds. If you look, you see across that middle line there, the middle column, English written hornbill, Catalan, Calao de Walde, in Czech, Zobrozek, Zulubabadi. Parang lahat na lang ng language around the world has a name for Walden's hornbill in their language, in their official language, except the Philippines. There is no official Filipino name. So it's about time that we do create one. And that's kind of a challenge for everyone and how we translate that for all the other birds of the Philippines. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. and. Uh, Again, thank you, NAST and uh, Philippine Science Heritage Center for the opportunity to talk to you and meet your scientists, ornithologists um, for World Wildlife Day. Thank you.